Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Panel one is about ready to start. So we are sharing our cameras now, all of the folks who are involved in the panel. So let's go ahead, unless I hear otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and get started because I know we're at time and I know we are short on time for the panel. So my name is Ronald Day and welcome to panel number one entitled Using Research to Promote the Humanity and Well-Being of Incarcerated Individuals. So I'm going to start with, uh, with a couple of comments, and then I'm going to introduce the dynamic panel that we have here today. Start with a couple of quotes. One is, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons, by Da Stoevsky. Always try to make sure I get his name correct. Also, another one, it is said that no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones, Nelson Mandela. As you'll see from my bio, I have a doctorate in criminal justice. I'm a vice president of programs and research at the Fortune Society, and I teach on Rikers and in New York State prisons for Columbia University. But for this particular conversation, it's important to know that I spent 15 years in New York State prisons and five years on parole supervision. This year makes 15 years that I've been home. Now I'm not sharing my background to ascribe any significance to myself. I'm highlighting this background to affirm the importance of directly impacted people being integral to these conversations as some of our colleagues have already said. Indeed, this particular topic of using research to promote uh, the humanity and well-being of incarcerated people is, is really a significant one. Now, we have a pretty strong inclination about what is transpiring in our facilities. And frankly, we know and understand that we have a responsibility to do better, not just to the incarcerated individuals and their families, but to all of our citizens. However, as academics, as researchers, as practitioners, as corrections officials, and other key stakeholders, we know that the existing research is often limited and restricted conversations with prison administrators, interviews with former incarcerated individuals and staff that work in carceral settings that has been among the most difficult of challenges. But let's be real, the way to promote the humanity and the well-being of incarcerated people is to be humane, to engage in humane practices and to treat people with dignity and respect. That has been made more complicated than it should be by our existing culture and the mentality of us versus them. It is imperative for us to hear from and engage with people who are incarcerated and the people who work in these facilities. Some of you have been able to cultivate relationships that have granted you access to jails and prisons around the country. The Prison Research Innovation Initiative is just one project that is piercing the correctional veil. There's also scholarly research and thoughtful commentary and opinion pieces from Urban, from Vera, from the Brookings Institute, from including from some of our attendees that addresses issues like quality healthcare, educational, vocational and therapeutic programming, solitary confinement, visits and much more. One such report is entitled, A Better Path Forward for Criminal Justice, Changing prisons to help people change, authored by Dr. Christy Visser, who I had the pleasure of working with recently, and Dr. John Eason. You are about to hear additional reflections about promoting the humanity and well-being for incarcerated individuals from, again, a pretty dynamic panel. And you have their bios, so I'm just going to say their names and titles. So David Garlick, Pennsylvania State Organizer for Straight Ahead. Daryl Chambers, research associate and co-investigator at the University of Delaware. Mindy Tanapel, executive director too at the Iowa State of Human Rights. And Jessica Janetta, a senior policy fellow at the Urban Institute. 
So let's get this conversation going. We have about 45 minutes and then we're gonna have 20 minutes for Q&A. So really, really excited for this conversation. So I wanna start with David. So David, as somebody who has spent time incarcerated and is active in the reform community, what do you see as some of the primary issues that need to be addressed to support the well-being of incarcerated people? I'd say really to two to name off the top is one is food. You know, uh, the food that they serve us in prison is horrible. A lot of the times with the vegetables, if that's what you want to call them, they would go straight from the cans into the pots onto the plate, really no seasoning, anything like that. And then some prisons, you know, you'll eat breakfast at 4 a.m., lunch at 1030 and then dinner between 330 and five. And if you don't have anybody sending you money, there you are, you're starving from 5 p.m. to four in the morning. Um, and then think about that too, as a commissary, you know, what they feed on or what they act, actually allow people to buy on commissary is very unhealthy food. A lot of starch, a lot of different things, sodium that would cause people's blood pressure to go up and issues like that, you know. So I, I think we need to definitely change the way that we feed individuals. We need to provide food that is better for the people that are incarcerated because there's a lot of times people are already coming into prison with bad health, you know. And so we're just exacerbating their health issues by the food that they's, they're being fed. The second I'd say is reentry, you know. Um, most states and BOP, they want to start reentry a couple months before somebody gets out of prison. And how many people go to college after three months in high school? You know, it doesn't happen. People go through 13 years of schooling before they go to college. It's the same thing as far as reentry. Reentry isn't something that you teach somebody in a two two day courses and you're like, hey, you can go out and you can reenter society. And so my mindset and what I always talk about is reentry needs to begin on day one. Ninety six percent of the people that are incarcerated are going to be released. We need to prepare them for that release. We need to help set them up for success instead of failure. And I think that that's something that our systems do. It sets people up for failure and it uh, allows them to get stuck in this revolving door. Thank you so much, David. I'm glad you mentioned food and nutrition because that's oftentimes something that is left out of the conversation. We talk about health care. We talk about, about solitary confinement and other issues, but that is very important. Uh, Daryl, I want to go to you next. A key focus of the Prison uh, Research Innovation Initiative is the use of participatory research methods. Can you describe how your team has used this approach in your work? with those who are incarcerated in Delaware. Yes, but let me start by uh, first explaining a little bit what um, PAR actually means. So PAR is an acronym that stands for Participatory Action Research. And keep in mind, this right here is a rich tradition, a tradition that goes all the way back to Kurt Lewin, the, uh, what, some, what some call the founding father of action research. But one of, uh, or somebody who followed his bloodline, Michelle Fine, what she defined it as is, it's a challenge to the way in which we did traditional research, right? So I wasn't born in traditional research where you get the grant at the R1 Institute, you build the theoretical framework, you construct the instrument, you take it to the community, you pay somebody $15, they go out there, get their uh, uh, surveys filled, bring them back and get tenure off of them, right? That's a traditional way. I was born and birthed in the PAR model, right? So I was born under Dr. Yasser Payne, who said that PAR is not only a mean of gathering data, but it's a way to empower the researcher, right? So those marginalized population that we're going to talk about, those who are housed there, right? And it's a way that they control their narrative so that they can legitimize some of the concerns in their respective community. And going back to the founder, what the founder says is that there is no action without research and no research without action, right? So this right here really means that how do you get those people from that targeted population to understand the impact of research and how do they become the researchers? So for me, what is PAR? PAR is a commitment to those participants, to those individuals, to those populations that we are seeking to get knowledge from. And it's a respect for that knowledge of all the participants, because there's a certain knowledge that you do bring from the universities that's not really held by a lot of people from the target population, but there's a lot of cultural things inside those populations that we as researchers really need to know about, right? And then there's a mutual understanding. 
in the words of my mentor, Dr. Yasser Payne, uh, social research plus social activism equal par. So it's the research, but it's also what print is all about, those innovations at the end, making those changes. How do we make those or improve those conditions to where these men are being housed at, right? So a specific example, uh, we really wanted to stay true to the traditional power model. So when we first started out interviews in 2022, the thing that we really wanted to capture or have people who be a part of this, what we call the IRC, the Emirate Research Committee, we wanted to make sure they have lived experience, right? Which is obvious, they're, they're housed there. So obviously they have lived experience about being incarcerated, but also social capital. Do they have the trust of the people who later on they're gonna be speaking for in sweat equity, right? Do they realize that some of the innovations or the changes that might take part or come from this particular project that they might not benefit from, right? So right there, we really try to do. And after that right there, we really wanted to explain to them in a real way, the history of PAR. And we wanted to make sure that later on during the, during the, during the peer review phase that we don't have people talking about, oh, they didn't know about methods, they didn't know about research. So we brought in well-renowned scholars like we're not, um, um, Renee Bachman, who taught them how to construct the interview, how to formulate questions. And from there, we allowed them, the people housed there, to go about and building their own domains, uh, uh, selecting the questions that, that are appropriate to the situation. And they are there because we recognize that these right here are the subject matter experts, right? And that's what we did. And that's how we employ it. Because we know that in the end, PAR is more than just a research project. It's a way of unionizing people. It's a way of empowering people. It's a way, as the keynote speaker said, a way that once they get out of here, we can provide them the real opportunity that they deserve. Thank you provide, for providing us that context out. That was very, very important. It reminds me of being in prison and thinking about <laughs> the non-traditional methods. Uh, guys got there and they start working in law libraries and doing research and it was like, yeah, I wish we had knew this before we came in prison in the first place. So Mindy, I wanna turn it to you now and ask you, as you were working in um, Iowa Correctional Institute for Women, which is the only women's prison, you know, in the Prison Research Innovation Initiative. So in the work, in your work so far, what have you seen as important issues that are unique to the women's uh, facilities? Thank you. Um, so I want to kind of start out by just describing a little bit of our participatory action research. And in our data walks, once we had the surveys delivered, um, we went out to the institution and had the women rate and kind of vote the questions that they thought it was most important for us to elevate with leadership. So we kind of got their top 10 um, subject or questions that they wanted leadership to focus on for areas for change for ICIW. And so I'm gonna talk about three of those. I do wanna mention that family and friends is one of the most important issues to them, but we're gonna have a question on that later. So I'm not gonna talk about that in this question, um, but it is something that is extremely important to that population. Um, so one of, or the actual top question that was identified by them was this prison should offer activities that promote certification and developing skills. And with that question, 60% strongly agreed and 33% agreed. So 93% of the incarcerated population really felt that education and certifications were one of the most important areas that they wanted to see improvement in. One of the common themes identified, and it kind of goes back to the keynote speaker as well, was to have equal work and apprenticeship um, opportunities as the male institutions do. Um, so in our male institutions within Iowa, we have welding, we have electrician apprenticeships and jobs, and we don't have those as um, opportunities within ICIW. And the women recognize that sometimes, you know, just the institution itself doesn't have the capability to do that, but they also recognize that some of those are more high paying and that they would set them up for better success once they are released. Um, so that was one area identified. Another area that was extremely important to them is health and mental health. And actually their third ranked question was my general healthcare needs are addressed in this prison. 7% strongly agreed, 
53% agreed, 26% disagreed, and 14% strongly disagreed. So it's a little bit split. But some of the themes, um, in addition to um, when we got them to vote on the questions, the other thing we did is a lot of conversations, and we gave them post-it notes to comment on each of the questions. So we could not only elevate which questions they thought were important, but also voice their concerns and be able to package them and present them to leadership as well. And one of some of the main comments and themes that we heard here is um, their issues were not taken seriously. Um, they felt that, you know, a lot of times they were maybe just given medication or just told to deal with it. And we know that research has shown that a lot of women experience a lot of trauma prior to their incarceration. So one of the opportunities that we've identified for future research um, that we wanna discuss with our research council in the participatory um, aspect of it is to develop a part of the questionnaire that focuses on prior trauma and how that relates to their current um, kind of stay that they are having and how it uh, plays into their outcomes as well. And then one last area that I wanted to touch on, um, in Iowa, we actually have nine institutions, eight male and one female. And so that kind of poses in and of itself some interesting kind of dynamics. So within the different male institutions, they kind of range from minimum security to maximum security. Length of stay is different between them. So they focus on different privileges and different priorities within those different institutions. At ICIW, they have the very short term that will be there for six months in relief. They have the life, life people that will be there um, for the, the remainder of their life. And so the priorities for each of those groups are very, very different. And so, and they live side by side. So trying to develop a community that helps those short term who are focused on re-entry and getting ready to go back into the community right alongside somebody that is more on quality of life and dealing with how they are gonna deal with the day to day within the institution um, are very, very different. And so ICIW has actually, they recognize this and they're actually working on solutions to try to merge them and you know kind of make sure that they can address the needs of both of those kind of different groups and all of the in-between as well. Thank you so much, Mindy. I mean, it's extremely important that we have the un, a much more thorough understanding about the differences between the women's experiences as, the, as well as the men's experience. Teaching in a women's facility in New York, a lot of things that you just shared is what I typically hear from my students. So thank you for, for sharing that information. So I wanna go to you, Jesse, now. Um, one issue that seems to be emerging across the Prison Research Innovation Initiative partner sites is access to programming, such as GED, post-secondary education, vocational training, and meaningful work, among other things. You've been working with corrections and reentry organizations for some time now. How have you seen programming influence outcomes of those who are incarcerated? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ronald. So I'll, I'll start this by talking about access and then getting into outcomes. I mean, access to programming and activities is, is something that has both been my experience very important to incarcerated people and varies quite a bit from facility to facility and in some places is not very present. That's been a longstanding issue in corrections in the United States and certainly is in Vermont, which is the state um, that I'm leading uh, Urban's work with through the, through the pre a lot of this has gotten much worse or much more challenged during the pandemic period, which I think is an important reality. Some of that is about restrictions that uh, departments of corrections have done in terms of movement or even you know, lockdowns as they're trying to um, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in their facilities. It's also impeded a lot of access to programs and activities because people who may have been coming in from outside the prison uh, to help make those things available have not been able to in many cases. And I think the pretty acute staffing shortages that departments are seeing all around the country, I think is also making programming more difficult. So it's been a particularly difficult recent period in terms of access to prison-based programs and activities of all kinds. So I'm here at the Urban Institute, and so I'll speak first about outcomes sort of from the research perspective, and people have looked at that in all kinds of different ways. But I will say there's been a 
pretty intense focus usually in the research on, on prison programs in terms of what happens when people get out. Now, I don't want to minimize that. That's obviously very important for people who are preparing uh, for that experience as almost everybody in prison is. Most specifically, there's been a pretty heavy focus on recidivism as the way of understanding how programs are going, although there's also sometimes, you know, been attention to things like whether people are able to secure employment or, you know, stable housing and things like that. Now, you know, the Reverend Nixon mentioned educational programming, employment programming. Those are things that, you know, in the main have been beneficial on those things. I'd add to that substance abuse treatment uh, for people who need it. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy programming has also been helpful. These are some of the programs that in terms of what we tend to measure in the research world have shown benefit. I will say, though positive, there's a lot of mixed in there, which at least to me suggests that there's probably a lot of uh, variation in the quality uh, and appropriateness of, of that programming. There's also a lot of evidence, although this is often less investigated, that the benefits of programming show up uh, in the prison. This tends to be measured in terms of prison misconduct, which I'm not sure is the best measure of the positivity that programs may be creating in prison, but it's not nothing. And I think we do have um, that evidence. Um, but the last thing I guess that I would like to say around thinking about outcomes. So it's very much on my mind. I was uh, this past weekend in Ann Arbor and I was uh, among other things, visiting the annual exhibition of art by Michigan prisoners that they have on the University of Michigan campus every year, uh, organized by the Prison Creative Arts Project, which is the organization through which a long time ago, I first got involved in doing work in and around prisons. And it was having me reflect upon the statements by the artists that they collect as part of that exhibition and also the conversations that I've had over the years with people I was working with in writing and theater workshops in prisons. And when they were talking about why those programs and those experiences were meaningful, they would tend to name things like connection that came from it, the opportunity to feel free, the opportunity to be making meaning and involved in work and activities that were meaningful to them, uh, feeling valued, the opportunity to contribute to society through art, uh, contribute wisdom, contribute challenge a lot of times, contribute beauty. And one of the things that I wanted to bring into this space is those things that I have heard over the years from people who incarcerated about some of the whether you want to call them outcomes or whatever you want to call them, the values, what was important to them about activities. And I, I think that's important. And particularly one of the things I like about pre in this conversation is the opportunity to think about those kinds of things that we're trying to create when we're thinking about what people should have access to in prison as they should anywhere else and how we think about the standard by which we say whether or not that is the things they have access to are good and sufficient. Thank you, Jesse. And I'm glad you talk about <laughs> recidivism and, and, and outcomes. And we know as a society that we have a tendency of focusing on recidivism. We were in meetings recently. I remember uh, Jeremy Travis said something that really resonated with me and is that we worship at the altar of recidivism. So I'm so happy to see many of us thinking about other ways to measure outcomes of people who have been impacted by the system and be on the lookout for the National Academies is putting out a paper on evaluating success of people who are in prison, That a committee that myself and others were, were able to be involved in. So that is something that's gonna, I think, be pretty uh, important for this particular conversation. So the next question I have is for you again, Jesse, I wanted to come back to you to talk about uh, a, a, something that you were touching on and that's uh, the influence of the, family members of those who are incarcerated, loved ones in particular, especially children. How has that come up in your work uh, with Iowa? How do the incarcerated people at the women's prison feel about their ability to stay in touch with people on the outside? Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so again, that was one of the most elevated things um, that we heard from the population um, was access to their friends and families, and not only for their overall well-being, um, but also for re-entry and getting themselves ready to go back into the community. Um, so the second question that they had us highlight with leadership was um, that more family activities and events should be made available 
available for incarcerated individuals. And 68% strongly agreed and 27% agreed. So a total of 95% um, thought the focus should be on family and friends. Another thing that we identified um, with the survey and the, the women really helped us to elevate is it is important to have video visits along with in-person visits. And again, here we had 96% agree. And that was actually one of the advantages of COVID. Um, I know we always have to find those because we have so many disadvantages with COVID, but um, ICIW had not had video visits before. And so it allowed people to make connections that they hadn't been able to with family and friends that weren't able to travel to ICIW before, um, those being out of state or just being from a long distance away and didn't have the capacity to get in. Um, so it allowed a lot of the women to make contact with their family and friends that they didn't have before. Um, now that COVID restrictions are starting to get lifted, visitation rights are starting to come back. And they just really talked about and wanted us to elevate how important it is for that kind of normalcy to return. Um, we're not 100% there yet because again, with um, you know COVID numbers still being a thing and still uh, they want to protect the safety, they don't have full contact yet. Um, but one of the really neat things about ICAW is they put a lot into the design and they did it very women centric in that in the visitation room, there is a playroom, a children's playroom, and there's an outdoor area so that the women can interact with their children um, kind of in that normal environment. So they can start to establish those relationships and have those kind of healthy interactions so that when they go back and return to their family, they already have that foundation built. Um, that was one of the things they also identified was they would like more programs and activities centered around family and how to, when they re-enter, go back to their family, how those interactions should look. What is a healthy relationship? How do I come from being at ICAW and reintegrate in a healthy way with my family. Um, so again, that was one of the most important things. And they talked about it, not only from contact and their mental health and well-being, but also getting them prepared for re-entry as well. Gotcha, thank you. And I'm sure, I mean, the issue of proximity, which Vivian mentioned, and just being able to be close to your family members, not having to travel hundreds of miles at times to be able to visit them is also something that is very important. I just wanna remind the audience that there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So if you have any questions, please um, you know, put them in the box and, and we have you know, someone helping us out so that we'll be able to share those questions when we finish this particular discussion. So I wanna turn now back to David. Uh, so David, you started us out with some really you know, insightful uh, comments. Healthcare is something that is talked about very frequently and not just healthcare, but quality healthcare for the incarcerated population, especially mental health. I mean, it's a crucial concern for people who are incarcerated. So tell me, what is the state of healthcare for those who are incarcerated? How can the reform community, which you've been involved in, take action to promote the mental and physical health of incarcerated populations, especially at a time when we read so many articles about Rikers, about Chicago jail, LA jail, that are basically Overflow with overflowing with people who have mental health issues. I mean, they basically refer to as as mental health institutions instead of jails. So, really interested in what you have to say. Well, I mean, one thing on the front end of stuff, you know, we have to stop uh, criminalizing mental health issues. We have to stop criminalizing addiction. You know, if we did that, that would prevent a lot of these individuals from going to prison. Uh, another thing we have to do on the front side is we have to have trauma-informed care. We need every state to become trauma-informed. You know, Mindy hit on it a bit, you know, when she was talking about the trauma and adverse childhood experiences. And yes, uh, typically about 90% of women have adver adverse childhood experiences, but a lot of studies, there's about 62% of men who have those same type of uh, experiences, you know? So you have these men who've experienced a lot of trauma, then they get arrested, which is traumatic. Then they go to the county jail, which is traumatic. Then they go through trial, which is traumatic. Then they go to prison, which is traumatic. And the things you see in prison is traumatic. So you have all this trauma 
stacked on top of trauma, stacked on trauma. And the mental health professionals in prison, they do more for giving out medication than they do actually counseling. You know, I went to see a psychiatrist and he talked 45 minutes about a picture that was on his wall and only five minutes allowed me to talk, you know, and that was the only time I went. So a lot of my healing had to take place because of self-help books that I was reading in my face, you know, in conversations. So I think we really need more professionals that are going to pour into the men and women, you know, and look at them and try to help them heal, you know, because that's really what it's about. It's about helping them heal because if they're not healed, you know, they're going to go back out and potentially hurt other people because we have this, uh, everybody knows the thought process, hurt people, hurt people. But to take it to the next level, helped people help people and healed people heal people. And that's where we have to get people to. Um, when we talk about medical health care in prison, it's pitiful, you know. I mean, I had a situation where I separated my shoulder playing basketball. It took them a month and a half for the doctor to finally tell me that I separated my shoulder. And there was nothing they could do about it because the length of time that went on, you know. Things like that, if that happened in the free world, that doctor would have been uh, lost his license because he did not fulfill the Hippocratic Oath. I, we, we also have to get away from our prisons becoming hospices. I did hospice work the last three years that I served. And just seeing these men die in prison that could have easily been released. But the, the Department of Corrections wanted to continue to judge this person for a crime that was committed 40 years ago when the person isn't the same person. And if somebody's paralyzed and can't do anything for themselves, how are they going to be able to commit another offense? So there's so many elders on our prison that we need to go ahead and release, let them come home to their families and to the services that are actually going to provide the medical care that they need. Thank you so much, David. I mean, it's pretty abysmal that people can't get out through these type of mechanisms, like you said, when they're uh, really sick and so forth. I remember my cousin was 22 years old, shot in the head and killed when I was in prison. And to your point, there wasn't you know, someone that I was able to talk to, with the exception of the people who are incarcerated with me. You know, you look to the, to the professionals to be able to do that, but they were just you know, not available. So David, I want to, I mean, sorry, Daryl, I want to come back to you. Um, David talked a little bit about food and nutrition earlier, and we know that physical fitness and nutrition are important components of well-being. Have these issues emerged in the work that you're doing in Delaware? Well, most certainly. <clears throat> and I will say that it was one of the uh, leading issues that was identified on the climate survey. Um, now, keep in mind, we're talking about the process here. So we have guys we have these experts who have constructed this survey they helped during the implementation phase they came back they helped us clean it so now we have these findings so keep in mind now we parts also data driven right so it's not like we're cutting down on the research uh, uh efforts right so this right here is really a data approach still and so what did the data say right because we asked about areas of healthcare and how do you feel they can be improved and the one thing they said, 50% said that there should be some alternative to medicine. Some said we need, like uh, uh, David just said, we need more exper experienced um, clinicians, right? Physical activity, right? 75% of the people identify um, the need for physical activity. And I'll explain a, a little bit more about that in a few minutes, right? But it had it was 18% 18 higher than the next category. But then he said consistent amongst the uh, mental health counselors, and activities such as puzzles and um, playing assistance. So when you think about this right here, and you think about um, the original intention of what they call Howard or Young, the institution, it was really intended to only house what we call detainees. So once you're inside, there is no grass. You're not touching grass. You're basically locked down. So, one, so, so, so when the guys identified the need for physical activity, uh, uh, it was not a surprise. But the data help us to go to the DOC with some concrete uh, uh, suggestions on how we can improve some of these conditions, right? And one of the things they said is that we need more exercise equipment on the housing units. There was a pull-up bar, one or two housing units, 
had like an elliptical machine or a bike of some sort. They said, we need to have more self-healing, self-meditation. We need to do some yoga, right? We need to be able to, or someone here with um, some trainers certifi certification so that we can get that consistent training. How can we get some nutritional stuff on the walls? All these kind of things right here, right? Print, print. Prison Research Innovation Network. Innovation, right? So now the key word is innovation. So how do we move from the science right now, right? And how do we now go to the implementation phase? So now how do we go about bringing some change inside the institution? So the guys, the IRC, uh, the uh, steering committee, they went to DOC. And now, and I'm proud to say that DOC had acted upon, had acted upon the data, had acted upon these guys' collective voices. So now we're so, so now we're getting the elliptical machines on the units. We're getting a uh, we're getting some stationary uh, 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 rowing machines on the unit. We're making sure there's more signage about uh, good exercises. We're trying to get yoga programs in. The certification programs are coming in, and all this right here was coming, and all this right here was brought about because these guys were able to collectively organize their thoughts and support it by data and bring it back to the folks because there was a real need for it. Um, and even when we went to the mental housing unit, uh, 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 to the department, and we asked them, or we told them about what we were trying to do, they were all in agreement, right? So this collective effort. So now, right, so what does it mean now that a guy is not stationary and that he's able to engage in some physical activity? It helps him mentally. It helps him physically. It helps with DOC bottom line. Uh, 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 it'd be interesting to see that once we get some equipment on, like how it impacts infractions or write-ups, because now guys have a way of relieving tension. Because right now, there's very few ways in which they can actually have any physical activity inside these jails. It's very limited space mostly all concrete, but by, but, by, but by being in the project and what Brent, what Brent really brought forth was that there was a need for some more physical movement and some physical equipment on the housing unit. And that was brought about through Penn in the guy's collective voices through uh, the climate survey. Gotcha, thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's really important to know that. Jesse, I wanted to, to come back to you before we have about maybe 12 or so minutes before we go to audience questions. And again, uh, those of you who are in attendance, please you know, put your questions into the Q&A section so that we can share those in a minute. Jesse, one thing that came to mind for me when you were talking about like access and outcomes, I remember that one of the more important things uh, for the administration often was not just that, not that people were getting access to education because there were GED programs, but you were able to like sign out of a GED program to go if, if, if you tested at like the eighth grade or ninth grade or something like that. And then you could just go and you can work in the industry or you can work in one of the other programs. So there was less of a promotion of that particular project. I mean, we know when people earn their GED or their high school equivalency while they're inside, and there's an opportunity to participate in college, which Vivian talked about, people can get access to it like I did when I was inside. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, do, do you see that happening in the work with Vera where instead of incentivizing people to finish their general education, their GED or their high school equivalency, people are just like signing out and going to work in other programs where for them, it's about putting some money in their pocket so that they can buy something for commissary to a certain extent versus you know, trying to finish this up, uh, this education, so that when I go home, I'll be much more, it'll be much more likely that I'll be able to secure employment and, and, and be marketable. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's one level at which that's a level of specificity that I want to be careful about, because I'm not sure how, how much I've seen that dynamic specifically. I do think in terms of what's available, Something that I think has driven, if not that specific trade-off, trade-offs like that is 
scarcity and opportunity and things that people can do. Like you can work or you can do school, but if you try and do both, there may not be enough of either to make that possible. And obviously there are only so many hours of the day. And like, even, you know, as David was talking about the, the meal, you know, schedules and things like that, there's, you know, one of the realities of prison is like the blocks that you can do anything are, are also scarcer in a way that, you know, folks that haven't had that experience, it can be hard to like fully understand. But I do, I guess my my main thought is in some ways you need more of everything and really to think about like how you can create not a scarcity situation in those things, but, you know, because most people in their growth and development, you need multiple opportunities to grow and do things. And if everybody, the to the the more that people are in a situation where because of time, because of waiting lists, because of scarcity, they have to make those choices. I mean, in some ways, because, you know, like work, you know, depending on what it is, can also be really beneficial, too. And I, I think that, you know, as much as possible, we shouldn't put people in situations if we can avoid it where they can only do one thing or, you know, another one like to bring in the visitation. I mean, it, our, our, our schedule set up so that doing productive activity of various kinds are in conflict with being available for visitation or family connection? Like, can we create a situation where people can do not just a thing, but multiple things, which again is, I think, you know, certainly in my experience, you know, like I, you, everybody has to make choices like that to some degree, but I think, you know, I had the benefit and I think, you know, many people have of the opportunity to, to do multiple things and not have to consider them to be strict trade-offs. Gotcha. Thank you. I appreciate that. We're going to move to um, a couple of minutes ahead of time. I think it's important to get audience perspective uh, in the conversation. So I'm going to go first uh, to Mindy. There's a question that came in for you. It says, um, you mentioned about the family aspect present in the women's results. But could you talk more about how a gender responsive approach is not only important, but necessary? in having this particular discussion? I think that's a really powerful question. Yes, it is. And it is, it's, it's interesting. And it's one of the things um, I also want to ask my colleagues who are doing the research in male prisons, because I'm interested to hear how they want it elevated, because I think you hit at it and the question hits at it. It's different. You know, women's interactions with their family is very different than male interactions with their family. And not that anyone is more important than the other, but I think just fundamentally, they are different in, in the healing process in the interaction process and how they can move forward. And I think that's part of the gender responsiveness is recognizing that and making programs and structure that really accommodates that. Like I mentioned, ICAW, when they designed their current facility, put a lot of mindfulness into designing a space where mothers could interact with their children. Again, start to develop those healthy relationships while they still are incarcerated. And we, you know, heard so much of the women elevating how important that was, not only to their mental health, but also to their reentry process to have that contact in a structured environment um, so that they, you know, a lot of them had fear of going back to their family and and not knowing how to act around, you know, their children and their, their loved ones and having that ability to do that in a structured environment and to receive feedback on those interactions was extremely valuable to them. Um, so, and I know ICAW is working very hard to get back to that um, after COVID, after those restrictions are getting eased um, to, to redeveloping um, those interactions um, because they have not been for almost a couple of years. And so um, everybody, the women and ICIW realized the importance of that and they are moving back towards that again. Thank you. Appreciate that, 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 that comment, Mindy. Uh, David, a question for you. And it really is about how, how did you come to this place where having been justice system involved yourself, you end up uh, being like a fierce advocate 
And I say that, you know, reading this question and thinking about a lot of the people that I talk to that are in the jails and in the prisons, and the last thing that they want to do is to go back into a jail, to go back into a prison, and to have any real interaction with folks who, you know, in this particular space where they're advocating. So it's, 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 it's sometimes a, a difficult mantle to have to pick up. So I'm curious about, you know, how you got into this and, and what allows you to be as, you know, as motivated as you have been. Well, I mean, I'm a client of Brian Stevenson. And so one of his famous, famous quotes is, you're not as bad as the worst thing you've ever done. So, I mean, having him as a, a lawyer and then just hearing that all the time, reading his book and stuff like that. And when I went to college after I got out, I, I was able to attend college nine months after I was out of prison. And my goal was to open up a home for kids and teens to get them off the streets, you know, but God had other plans and then put me in the criminal justice major and studying that, you know, and I've always been somebody who always wanted to help people, you know, and so who better to help than the people that have been left behind, you know, and so that's what my passion is, you know, I do a lot of work around, uh, about reentry, I do work around prison education, I do work uh, the work I'm doing in Pennsylvania, we're working to abolish life without parole and create parole eligibility for elders and geriatric. And also I do a lot of work around the sexual offender registry and working to abolish that. So um, in all of this, you know, it's just my passion to, to look at these men and women, you know, and a lot of times they're marginalized, they're left behind, you know, at times they don't have family, they're fighting for them. So we in this work, we're their surrogate family members, you know, we're there, we're the people to give them hope, to give them encouragement, you know, and 96% of the people that are in prison right now are going to be released, you know, and I want to help pave the way so they have that path when they get out that they can follow it to stay out, you know, I don't want somebody just to survive when they get out. I want them to thrive. I want them to be the best version of themselves, you know, uh, uh, the story that they had when they went to prison is something that they get to put a period on and write the next chapter, you know, and I want to give them the, the resources to write the best chapter ever. Like, I want it to be like Stephen King esque where everybody's like, wow, you know, that person was formerly incarcerated. There's no way I would have never guessed it, you know, and it's just about changing that narrative, you know, and as, as everybody's been talking about, you know, how do we do that? We get proximate. We go back. We have these conversations. We help them. We allow those people on the inside to see that there are people like us who have been incarcerated, but are out here who are thriving, who are successful, who have families, who have kids. And that's what they want. That's what they're dreaming for. And we're going to allow them to dream again and to have hope. Thank you, David. Uh, appreciate that. And this reminds me of, you know, I think about we often hear that, you know, you put things behind you, you know, in, in order to be able to move forward. I remember reading a, I think it was a Native American proverb that talked about how we need to keep things in front of us and not forget where we've come from in order to be able to, um, to continue to make progress. And Vivian talked about this, how we're having this discussion now about actually going backwards with some of the reform. Uh, Darrow, I see your hand up. You want to comment? And I have a question for you as well. Yes. Um... I want to comment, but um, David, like you touched on so many great things there. And um, I think that the university had a great relationship with our DOC to the point that a lot of the guys who were originally part of the IRC, the MA um, Research Committee, are now getting out of prison, right? So now we're talking about the transformative nature of PAR. Because in the end, not only do we want to see some, um, some changes, some revolution, but we also want to see how is the individual, how is it transformative, not just socially, but to the individual, right? So what happens in real time? You know, so we take them through this process. We think about research. We tell them about uh, 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 there is a life after jail and all this stuff right here. But in real time, this is what they're doing in Delaware now. We got guys going to the halfway house. We got guys on the original team who now are out. And we set them up so now that that skills that they learn inside the prison, they're getting $25 an hour with full benefits. So now, right, they're making that livable wage that they talk about all the time. 
And these guys are some of the strongest advocates, David. They're some of the strongest people out there who are telling the story. And not only that right there, they're actually controlling their narrative, right? So they're informing the policy, the practice and the program, right? So no longer can we allow the people who are sitting in these ivory towers who have who don't live within proximity of some of these phenomena they want to study be the sole scholarship behind the policy, the practice, and the program to be implemented. Now we got two more guys that should be released soon, and we got jobs lined up for them. I'm talking about real-time stuff. So, and I'm telling you, and this right here is a collaborative effort still between the guys that are in DOC and grassroots community to where we're making these opportunities available. And that right there is something that is just something that just happened out of the experience of uh, working with the DOC um, on this project. Well, it's wonderful to hear that people who are transitioning from the facilities are going home to gainful employment opportunities and that it has something to do with the initiatives that they were involved in on the out and on the inside because you hear so often people that are involved in projects inside there's no connection at all to the success if they have it <laughs> that ends up coming to them on the outside so thank you for sharing i have a question for you too that i think is is a pretty wise one so it says how are biases monitored and addressed throughout PAR's research design process and outcome. And typically, uh, knowing that typically the researcher is dealing with their own biases. So I'm sure you have something interesting to say about that. Yeah, so just like any other project, they're, they're addressed the same way. Uh, the people on the inside, the guys who they say have an agenda or have some biases, that's not their expertise. That's not their area. That's why, right? So I do what they call a more uh, aggressive form of PAR. I do what they call street PAR, where we actually got street identified people on there. So our training is the same training that you would see at a graduate level school, right? So I'm saying if you're in grad school, you're talking about, uh, 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 about an 18 week course that Dr. Payne has set up. So we go, we go from everything from the history of PAR to ethics, rules, and regulation, legitimacy. So we cover that right there. Now, because of the stuff that we have here, the limitations in COVID, we weren't able to take a, take a deep dive like that. But ordinarily, all those topics right there are covered, right? Recognizing biases, right? right? How to overcome them, recognizing that there is bias in every research project, right? You can't get around that. You see what I'm saying? But my thing is that right there, right? So we got trained experts. I heard you say something about Chrissy Fisher. Chrissy Fisher is one of the PIs on this project a person who's world-renowned in, 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 in the world of criminal justice. So, right, we have subject matter expertise that if we see these kind of things creeping in, and keep in mind now, right, while we do recognize that the guys on the project, the, the IRC, are experts, and they have what we call controlling authority, and they have advising authorities, there's also controlling and advising authority on the research end. So if something is not coming out right, that's going to jeopardize or interfere with the project, know that those issues right there are going to be addressed in real time. Got you. Thank you. And I'm glad you made that point about biases are inherent oftentimes, no matter the type of project that you have. We all come to these projects with our own experiences. So we can't pretend like as if that's not the reality. Jesse, you had your hand up. I'm uh, sure that you I, I, have I a comment. One thing, but this yeah. right here is a way of a lot of researchers discounting the value of guys participating or working on these kind of projects. So they look at stuff like that. Like, so yeah. is, is the method strong? Of yeah, course sure. the method exactly. is strong. You see what I'm yeah. saying though? Um, no, no, no. These guys got biases. They, they hate the system. No, they, they no. Yeah, exactly. No, it's not exactly. like that. And I apologize for that, Jesse. No, no, no. Thank you for that additional all. context. Go ahead, Jesse. And then I have a, yeah. I have a question for you as well. Yeah. And Ronald, I think one of the, the things building on what you were saying, I mean, to take a different angle on the question, I think one of the great strengths of PAR is the way that it mitigates bias from people like I like I'll just say I statements like I think that whether it's in participatory methods or just various ways in my work that I've been able to engage with people in, in communities most impacted has been the most effective thing, I think, in, in mitigating some of my own biases and getting at some of my unexamined assumptions. I was thinking about some partners I've had who have thoroughly examined some of my assumptions. And I think that some of the things that I was even saying about recidivism and its limitations 
I'm channeling things that people have put to me because of various kinds of engagement. So I think that another way of thinking about, you know, par and bias is that it broadens the perspectives that are part of the operation and that forces, and, you know, if it's really working right, everybody to have their biases challenged more thoroughly. And I think it's a real strength of it and part of why it can produce just more broad-minded ways of examining questions on the whole and something I've really appreciated in my career. That's good. That's great to hear. I mean, again, I, I, having served 15 years inside, I think that my perspective is valuable. And you, again, you can't remove that when you talk about engaging in research projects, but you also, you know, want, are trying to understand the, the, the folks that you are talking to, the prison administrators, et cetera. So one of the questions that came up is, for you, Jesse, is there's been talk about recidivism um, as being a subpar indicator of success. I mean, I, I wouldn't even refer to it as subpar. <laughs> what should we be doing to understand success in reentry? And I say that as someone who I mentioned earlier was on the National Academy of Science evaluating success of people who've been in prison uh, committee and looking for, again, that report will be coming out, but definitely looking forward to hearing what you have to say about some alternative measures to how we can uh, measure success for people who have been inside. Sure. So I'll, I'll say uh, a couple of different things. I mean, one is, this is both and. I mean, we are talking about like in all the different things we're saying, incredibly complex phenomena and complex lives like we all have. So you need to look at it in multiple different ways to really understand what's going on. And it's not that recidivism is is irrelevant, but also to say, so first of all, to pull it into the pre-context, one of the things that I think I appreciate as a, as a different angle that pre has is it's about conditions in prison. And one of the ways you might think about limits of recidivism there. So say you've got somebody who is not going to come out of prison for 10 years or more. If recidivism is the primary thing you're looking at, basically sort of, if you're really focused on that solely, or, you know, or, or heavily, you're saying the thing that matters can't even happen necessarily for way into the future. And you're taking off the table, really, really measuring what's going on right now. But I think that, you know, people's lives are being lived in prison in these cases, and you need to look at it. And I think one of the things that's been great about the climate surveys is helping, you know, the systems we're working with be able to monitor some of those things right now in the environment where it is. And also, and this doesn't inherently have to be the case, but I think recidivism and the focus on a lot of the conversations about it are very individualizing. It's making it really about individual people and what they're doing and kind of putting success or failure on them. And if I can touch on some of the questions about collateral consequences I've seen in the Q&A, a lot of things when you think about how many different difficulties the law and systems put in the way of people. I think having other things, you know, to a degree, whether somebody's got employment or stable housing is, you know, I mean, it says often something about their own individual success, but a lot of that is structural. A lot of that you could say, this is really about system and government and law and the failure of people to be able to get employment, the failure of people to be able to access housing that's stable that's a societal failure. And I think adding some of those things does allow you to look at what's going on individually, but also kind of think about as a system, as a society, these broader views, how are we doing? And I think that's one of the values of not centering recidivism too much. Excellent, thank you. David, I have a question for you, then Mindy, I'm gonna come back to you. And I know David, there, there are a couple of comments that are in the question and answer, some of which, as Alice or David has said, we can potentially share later and then reach out to some of the attendees directly to get some of those questions answered. But if you want to answer something that came up, David, please do so. And then I'm going to come back to you with a question. Yeah, I mean, uh, the one, one person was talking about how that they can get involved, you know, outside of just the, the academia, you know, and I would definitely check into just the different reentry organizations or criminal justice reform in your area, you know, definitely check out Vera Institute of Justice, prison policy, 
Urban Institute. Uh, definitely check out what Just Leadership USA is doing. This is a national organization that is training individuals that are formerly incarcerated and family members are formerly incarcerated. Um, if you want to learn more about like prison education, Noel Vest is on here and they do some stuff. Uh, amazing uh, thing is P2P, uh, prisons to PhDs. Uh, Stanley Andres is over that. So there are definitely amazing organizations all over the country nationally and locally that are doing work around criminal justice reform, doing work about abolition, doing work around prison education. So there's there's definitely ways that people can get involved, you know. And uh, another thing is uh, people were talking about, like, how do we change laws? How do we do that? The way we do that is we have these organizations reach out to legislators, reach out to senators and let them know that some of the bills that they're trying to write up are stupid, they're dumb, and we need to change them, you know, and uh, mobilize behind that. You know, the work we're doing in Pennsylvania, I'm over the grassroots lobbying right now. That's where I'm getting just normal citizens, normal constituents, college kids to start setting up these meetings, you know, and it's very interesting how few people know that they have power beyond voting, you know, that they can call their representative and set up a meeting and talk to them about different bills, you know, so that's definitely important with where we're at, you know, Noel talked about some of this stuff in one of the questions as far as like where academia has created these politicians, you know, and how can we get back to academia, how can we have this conversation with academia and I'd say that conversation is going in and educating these kids how to use their voice and to to be powerful advocates as students you know because just think I've taken a couple on some visits you know virtual visits and it's amazing that the legislators and senators looks like wait how old are you you're in college why are you on this call and they're like because we're passionate about this issue Gotcha. Thank you. So I'm asking you a question, and many I'm gonna come to you. So, um, so David, the, some feedback that you know received from people who are post in post release or you know transitioning from prison is tension with family members. So, you know, overbearing uh, family members, also having children once you make the transition, excitement from family members that can be interpreted as undue pressure. The reality is being unemployed, coming home to a stock refrigerator and, and eating out that refrigerator and not making a contribution. So tell me, you know, if you can quickly, just what are your thoughts about, about dealing with some of that pressure? I'd say really, you know, I, everybody knows the African proverb where it says it, it takes a village to raise a house. You know, my spin on that is it takes a village to allow a returning citizen to be successful. So this person that's coming home, you know, if they're only relying on the support and help of their family and they have these issues in the family home, in, in the, the house, I mean, it's going to cause a lot of issues and they could easily go back and reoffend, you know, so they have to have other resources outside of their family, you know, so different, the community, a faith of, a place of faith, uh, other people that can come alongside and walk with them and where they can talk and just share what they're going through. Counselors, you know, are definitely needed. You know, we definitely have to get away from this stigma that real men don't go see counselors. You know, everybody, Everybody and their mama should be seeing the counselor. You know, we all have trauma in different ways. But I think the main thing there is that they need to have another outlet outside of the family where they could talk about these issues, you know, instead of letting it fester up, you know. And um, before the people are, are, are released, you know, there has to be definitely programs that help with that family dynamic to help the whole transition period. My people ask me, what's your ideal prison ministry? And I don't tell them people going to preach once a month. You know, that's not my ideal. My ideal prison ministry is for people to go in and to befriend these people for six months a year before they get out of prison. And then when they get out, walk with them for six months or a year or however long to help that transition, you know, because we're relational beings and we need that relationship. We need that person that we can talk to when 
everything hits the fan, you know? I mean, at times you can't talk to your wife when she's the issue, you know? So you need that support. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Mindy, I'm going to come to you. We're at 3.30 now, so we have about five minutes left, so you can answer maybe in a a minute or two, and then we're going to get some final comments from from all of the panelists. So one of the things is... um, that came up is about the environment, the physical uh, place of incarceration. How has that been a part of the conversation, if at all, w- with the women that you work with? Because we know how if you're in a dingy, um, decrepit kind of place, then you know how is it? You know what 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 are the expectations? So I'm curious about what you have to say. Yeah, and like I mentioned, um, ICIW is a a newly renovated institution within Iowa, and at the time of the innovations, they were very mindful of that. Um, I heard Daryl speak to the very confined living spaces that their population experiences. When ICIW was built, um, a lot of times even the, the women refer to it as a college campus, so it has a lot of space. It has a lot of Um, just open air. And so for them, and we heard a lot of them talk about how beneficial that is in their overall day-to-day experience and in their overall rehabilitation as well. So the ability to walk outside, um, to experience that. And so, and like I mentioned, that environment, visiting room where they can have contact with family and friends. And so that's something that they have raised is extremely important um, in their overall well-being while they are at ICIW. Thank you so much, uh, Mindy. I mean, it's obviously important. Vivian said, we're not going, we're not at a place now where we're talking about abolishing all of our jails and prisons. So the least that we can do is make it humane for people who are there. So let's take about, about a minute or so. We, we have until 3.35 for everyone, you know, a little less than a minute. So please try to stick to that time because we do want to, we want to um, break at 3.35. So, um, so why don't I start with you, Jesse, some, some kind of uh, closing or uh, final comments. I mean, I think I just want to repick up something that David put on the table and that we saw very strongly in the survey results in Vermont, both staff and incarcerated side. And that's just the intensity of the presence of trauma in the populations that people bring to prison, that they experience in prison. And although we don't know this because we like what this was like non-COVID, I can only imagine that that's there very prevalently. And I just think looking at that information, just feeling how much work there is to be done to try and mitigate the trauma that people have experienced and are experiencing who are incarcerated and also working in the prisons. That's huge. Gotcha. Thank you. I mean, it's crazy how COVID has turned all of our lives upside down and allow us to think differently. David, it's on you. Final comments. I mean, I, I'm just thankful that you all are here. And the reason that you're here is you're you're interested, you're passionate about the work that we're doing, you know. So if you have questions, reach out to all of us. You know, we're more than willing to to let you know to to partner with us and the work that we're doing. But it, it takes all of us to get this done. You know, we need all of your help, your assistance, your wisdom, your knowledge. And together, you know, we can change the criminal legal system. I don't call it a criminal justice system because there's no justice to it, you know. So help us change the criminal legal system. And thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Daryl? Uh, Vivian says something about what makes us safe. And she outlined this thing called opportunity. And why, Mindy, you talked about the limited space. But let me tell you what happened when you have a project such as print. One of the areas that they identified, to about the IRC, they said that we need more opportunity, right? More, more training. And one thing they identified, like 77% of them said, we need CDL training. So even despite the confined space, when this information was brought to the DOC, now we have two simulators inside DOC to where the guys can actually get this certified train, right? So this right here is the kind of progress that you need because the guys in there, they're not helpless, they're powerless. And once we begin to empower them the way we did through print, we'll see the change that you talk about, David. Thank you so much, Daryl. And Mindy, it's on you, final comments, please. Thank you. I kind of want to reiterate what has been said already, like Jesse said, and David mentioned as well, all of most of the people that we see are incarcerated have a very traumatic background. And instead of looking at the crime that they've committed, let's look at what happens to has happened to them and how we can make them better, heal, 
give them opportunities to learn, be educated, so that when they return to society, they can contribute and have healed from what they have experienced before they got there. Thank you. You see, we ended on time as we said we would. Thank you, David. Thank you, Daryl, Mindy, and Jesse for a really extraordinary conversation. We appreciate it. And audience, we still have nearly 200 people here, so that's very exciting. So we're gonna take a five minute break and then we'll return with the, with the, with the rest of the uh, conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>